Good morning, Switzerland. Good evening, China. Huayi, and welcome to the very first Sino Swiss Energy Innovation Forum organized by Swissnext in China in partnership with the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, Swiss Engineering, Shanghai Energy Research Society, and Presence. Switzerland. I'm very excited to be guiding you throughout the two-day event packed with inspiring presentations from top-level industry leaders, academics, and startups. I'd like to let you know that we have interpretation in both English or Chinese available via Zoom. And of course, we'd like to hear from you as well. So if you have any questions to our startups, to our speakers, academics, or industry leaders, please send them in by the Q&A function, and I'll make sure that we try to answer them at the end of the event. You can also access the participants' booklet and full program by the QR, QR code on screen or by entering the URL that you also see on the screen. And now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Felix Mösner, Science Consul and CEO of Swissnex in China for some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Tanya, for the opening introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Dacha Hao, hello everyone. Welcome to the first Sino Swiss Energy Innovation Forum. My name is Felix Mösner. I'm the CEO of Swissnex, the Science Consulate of Switzerland in China. Swissnex is here to build bridges and connect Switzerland and China in education, research and innovation. Situated in the middle of Europe, Switzerland is a landlocked country with no natural resources. This is why we have to continuously invest in brains, produce innovative solutions and explore new frontiers, as we do today with the Energy Innovation Forum. The forum will focus on the topics electricity grid and renewables and will feature 35 inspiring presentations from top governmental representative, industry experts, academics, and startups. Therefore, uh, creating a platform to exchange exciting, cutting edge science and technology driven energy innovations, strategies, market developments, and policies from Switzerland and China. In particular, the efforts behind the Energy Innovation Forum are driven by the aim for, the, for a climate neutral Switzerland by 2050 and China by 2060. The idea is therefore to bring Swiss and Chinese talents together in this digital forum where follow ups can then be encouraged. We hope to spark many collaborations among the 300 registrants and to be back next year, but then in person. Again, thank you to our four important partners and my whole team at Swissnex for the excellent job during the past weeks. Without further ado, I wish the forum two successful days. Thank you to everyone. Tanya, the floor goes back to you. Many thanks, Felix. And with this, uh, the forum is opened. And I'd like to welcome State Secretary Benoit Reva, Director of the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, to the virtual stage now for a keynote on policy. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, good, uh, good evening to China. Good morning to Switzerland. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank Felix Mosner and all the, the Swiss Next team for organizing this first Sino Swiss Energy Innovation uh, Forum. So, as just mentioned by Felix Mosner, uh, now China and Switzerland have committed to climate neutrality by 2050, respectively 2060. And innovation is key to achieve this goal. So, today's forum is a great opportunity for our countries to share expertise in this field. Switzerland's energy strategy 2050 has two main objectives. On one side, increase energy efficiency, on the other side, to expand renewable energies. So today's topic, electricity grid, has a major role to play in this process we can only implement our energy strategy if we have efficient and reliable grid infrastructure. 
So the challenges for the power grids are raising in Switzerland. This is due to the constantly increasing integration of renewables in the power generation mix. The results of the recently published Swiss Energy Perspectives 2050 plus show it. A challenge for the grid is to combine historically a few hundred centralized generation capacities with, in the future, hundreds of thousands, millions of distributed generation installations, electric vehicles, and heat pumps. Also on the demand side, needs for flexibility are raising. Currently, just a fraction of the flexibility potential is used. That's why Switzerland is working to facilitate the integration of intelligent load management systems. An important point here is also self-consumption. We work at developing virtual self-consumption communities. Until 2027, Switzerland will replace up to 80% of its measuring systems by smart meters. Furthermore, to push innovative solutions, we are amending our electricity policy to allow utility customers to have access to their real-time meter data locally. The Swiss Federal Office of Energy is also drawing up both a smart grid strategy and a smart grid roadmap for Switzerland. The goal is to form an efficient overall grid system that can be operated safely and reliably. Additionally, Switzerland finances innovative grid research and pilot projects. Allow me to mention here three examples. The first one is a new 3D geographic information system that calculates the optimal path of new overhead and underground cable transmission lines. This web platform produces 3D visualization that shows a clear impact of a new transmission line on the surroundings. Second one, in order to improve the reliability and efficiency of grid operation, we are also developing a procedure for continuous monitoring of system perturbations caused by customer installations. With this monitoring, it is possible to reliably identify customer installations with impermissibly high grid perturbations and avoid unnecessary investment in remedial measures that are not required. Third example, we also support the development of a novel method to adapt in real time the protection settings for the power system. With the increased integration of distributed generation in distribution grids, traditional protection schemes become inadequate. The new method allows an update of protection settings to the changing grid operation conditions such as distributed generation power and grid topology. I could carry on with the numerous other current projects dealing with grid integration of e-mobility, intelligent buildings, digitalization, or distributed storage. As mentioned, we need smart solutions to reach our energy and climate goals. Today's event brings our two countries together to exchange on these decisive issues and benefit from recent technology developments. I look forward to the upcoming inspiring presentations and dis discussions, and thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, State Secretary Reva. And with this, we move to our academic uh, presentations now. Uh, Professor Dongying Wang, uh, Director General of uh, the Energy Research Institute at the National Development and Reform Commission in China is next up. The floor is yours.
谢谢主持人，各位朋友，早上好，下午好，嗯，我来自中国宏观经济院能源研究所，啊，我今天这个演讲啊，讲四个观点，第一个呢，就是双碳目标下的中国经济社会发展战略，我们都知道。中国政府以讲生态文明理念和生态文明建设，写入了《中华人民共和国宪法》，纳入了中国特色社会主义的整体布局。中国以生态文明思想为指导，贯彻新发展理念，以经济社会发展全面绿色转型为引领，以能源绿色低碳发展为关键。坚持走生态优先、绿色低碳的发展道路。那么，去年9月22日，国家主席习近平正式宣布了中国将力争2030年前实现碳达峰， 2 0 6 0年前实现碳中和。这是中国基于推动构建人类命运共同体的责任担当和实现可持续发展的内容、内在要求做出的重大决决策。那么，习主席指出，实现碳达峰、碳中和是一场广泛而深刻的经济社会系统性变革。从我们现在就是说，无论是业界也好，学术界也好，还是企业，还是普通的这个居民，啊，我感觉到就是说，我们现在对这个碳达峰和碳中和啊。远没有理解到像我们的这个习主席所所提到的，就是说实现碳达峰、碳中和是一场广泛而深刻的经济社会系统性变革，啊，就未来到底对我们意味着什么？我们的目标是什么？我们会变成我们的社会经济社会会变成一个什么样？很多人并不清楚，在认识上还存在着差距。所以，所以我们的习主席讲。要把碳达峰、碳中和纳入生态文明建设整体布局，拿出抓铁有痕的这个劲头，如期实现二零三零年前碳达峰、二零六零年前碳中和的目标。所以，从这个双碳目标的这个提出，以及一系列就是中央的这个战略部署，可以说就是中国的经济社会发展战略的这个方向和具体的战略已经。已经谋定了，谋定了。那么第二点呢？我想给大家介绍一下，就是中国目前的能源系统的定性描述。就是我本人是一个长期从事能源发展战略规划、政策研究的这个工作者，工作者啊，所以我自认为啊，就是说我对我们国家的这个能源系统啊，还是比较。清晰的认识。那么，全球温室气体排放主要是这个二氧化碳，其中 90% 来自化石燃料、煤炭、石油和天然气的燃烧。那么，按照我们国家的这个统计公报啊，它只有2014年的这个碳排放那个统计公报啊。数据公开的数据，那么我呢借用一下，就是说根据 REA 的这个统计 ，REA 的统计， 2 0 1 7年就是说中国的化石燃料二氧化碳排放量大概是九十二点九十二亿吨，九十二点五八亿吨。那么当时这个数呢，已大于美国、欧盟二十八国和日本的二氧化碳排放总和。那么两年过去之后，到二零一九年，实际上中国的化石燃料占一次能源消费比重为百分之八四点七，啊，这个比重在下降，但化石燃料消费量却比二零一七年增加了二点五亿吨标准煤。所以从这个角度来看，就是中国的这个碳排放量，碳排放量仍处于上升通道。所以这也就是习主席为什么提出，就是我们要在努力争取2030年前碳达峰
比之前提出的目标，实际上啊决心更大，更大。那么为什么会有这种状态呢？那么我们可以分析一下中国的这个当前的能源系统的这个特征。那么我归结了以下这么几个特点，就是当前的能源系统的这个特特征啊，一个呢特点呢是大系大系统。今天没有时间跟大家展开，我从字面上，我想各位能够理解，就是说中国的能源系统的这个特征。第二个是集中式，第三个呢是自上而下，啊啊，自上而下。第四个呢，还是相对的比较封闭。最后一个呢，是以供方为中心，就是我们的这个电源啊，发电方啊，还是这个对这个怎么讲呢？在这个能源系统供应中啊，还要占据到这个就是说主导地位。换句话说，我们应按理说应该是消费者是上帝，但我们现在实际上还是以供方为围绕供方为主，电网的建设、输电线路的建设。啊，表面上看似通向这个消费端，实际上是围绕着这个电源的建设点开展的。所以这就为我们就是说有一个就如何实现这个双碳目标，能源是一个关键。我们的习主席讲，能源低碳发展是关乎人类的未来。我们现在要打造一个新型的能源系统。那么什么样的新型能源系统呢？要以构建新能源为主体的新型电力系统为核心而打造。怎么打造这个系统？习近平主席2014年6月就提出了“四个革命，一个合作”的能源安全新战略，已经为新时代中国能源发展指明了前进方向。那么，就“四个革命，一个合作”有其内在的逻辑关系，缺一不可。所以呢，从我们打一个比喻，可以，就是说，从能源是经济社会系统的血液，新型电力系统能够助推实现一场广泛而深刻的经济社会系统性变革。如何打造？就电力系统而言，主干电网就像人体的动脉、静脉，需要加强，毋容置疑。但更需要的是打造新的毛细血管和更换新的血液。与此同时，要把打造新型电力系统纳入到生态文明建设整体布局，具兑换什么样的血液要有硬约束。那么第三点呢？中国能源转型变形的转型变革的思考。刚才我讲了，就是我们现在的能源系统的主要特征。那么我们未来系统要转变成什么样的一个系统呢？未来能源系统的主要特征，我也给出了五个特点，一个是模块化、分布式、自下而上、开放的，以消费者为中心。啊，时间不多了，我就简单的总结一下，如何打造这个未来的能源系统。我们现在看得清楚的，实际上就是我们的产业中要向电气化转型，行业实现智能化。电力绿色化是基础。王老师，好，我知道最后还有一点，嗯，最后还有一个观点，好，就是第四点，嗯，我们要中国能源第一碳发展啊，与双碳目标的实现，将助推全球实现低成本的低碳。呃，王老师，我们要继续，对不起，非常感谢你。Oh, <laughs> and time is up. Thank you very much, Professor Wang. No problem. We'll continue with Professor Massimiliano. Uh, Capizzali, uh, head of the Energy Competence Center of, uh, at the School of Management and Engineering in Vaux. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. 
I will share my screen. Thank you for this opportunity. Hello to everybody. I hope you see my screen. So in the time that is that I have available, I will talk about uh, networks convergence, which is a, a, a problematic on which we are currently working. And I would like to give first a definition of what is meant with networks convergence. Networks convergence refers to networks, energy networks that coexist and interact on a given territory. And the energy networks we are referring to are the electricity network, the natural gas network, and the heating and cooling network. And in fact, networks convergence indicates a voluntary and controlled interaction among these networks. It relates to both distribution and transport networks, and in fact is based in part on existing technologies such as cogeneration. And in fact, the future energy smart grids uh, will also interact in fact with the telecommunication network in the future. Uh, but why should we need energy networks convergence? Three facts, uh, all of the energy networks face specific challenges. The electric network due to the penetration of new renewables, load variations, electric vehicles, and other challenges. Natural gas network have a challenge in a term of probable decrease of selling volumes due to energy efficiency and maybe also local carbon policies. And while heating and cooling networks have a strong political support, of course, the financial viability for these networks uh, can be put in questions. The other type of networks, in fact, can help one single network, and the answer to these challenges can take the form of synergies with the other networks. And this is exactly where networks convergence come. And the natural gas network can, in fact, play the role of a flexible interface towards this network operability. Of course, one uh, important technology uh, for network convergence is what is called power to gas. And power to gas is what? Uh, power to gas is the direct link between the gas infrastructure and the power infrastructure by way of electrolysis, with the idea to use, for example, excess renewable production uh, to make this link. The levels of power are very broad. And there are many possibilities you can stay, of course, at the hydrogen level or make other products out of this uh, conversion. Could be natural gas, could be methanol, could be power again. Uh, and so creating a link, a flexibility between these two fundamental energy infrastructure. Excess electricity is not peanuts. You see here a few numbers for Europe. Excess electricity from new renewables will become more and more important in the future and power to gas can be uh, an answer to that. And of course, you, in cities, you don't have to forget district eating networks. And you see here a representation of how future cities could look like with the three um, networks working together to provide services to the territory. Why are renewable energies and networks connected? In fact, for the electricity network, it is clear that the new renewable energy sources bring challenges in terms of intermittent production, decentralized production, and also the fact that production can be located far away from consumption centers. So the future electricity network, all of us know that, will need storage, will need technologies to absorb power, and also deployable generation capacities to compensate consumption peaks. And here, for example, decentralized cogeneration could be important in countries which have continental uh, climate to compensate the, heat, the power requested by heat pumps during cold winter days. In all three cases, networks convergence can bring solutions, not all the solutions, but part of the solution. Networks convergence is an opportunity for natural gas and for future renewable gases that will use the natural gas infrastructure. Because, of course, natural gas grid has also challenges on its side. Um, because it will, uh, it will, of course, need asset management optimization and will also cope with the future injection of renewable gases toward, among other challenges. However, 
the framework conditions are not clear for the moment being, at least in Europe. And of course, what will be the future role of Arigen? Will it be used alone or as blending with other fossil or renewable gases? So these are questions which are open. And I will finish my presentation with one example of a big uh, scientific project that we brought at the ASHU IGVD in, co in collaboration with the Canton of Geneva, where we optimized the existing natural gas network over the entire territory under three constraints. So taking into account the penetration of heat pumps and the associated increase in electricity consumption, the building renovation policies that lead to a reduction in heat demand on the territory, buildings will consume less and less um, energy for their consumption, for their uh, heat, and the disappearance of one or more technologies, for example, combustion boilers, as a result of political decision. So this is an optimization model where we try to cover the heat demand, in fact, by future acceptable technologies, district in network, heat pumps, solar collectors, cogeneration, and uh, sl um, sl uh, slowly phase out unacceptable technologies, such as direct combustion of oil, wood, and in the end also natural gas. And while taking into account the future heat demand in terms of rebirthment. And the results are displayed here for a series of hypotheses, of course. This we have done also the sensitivity analysis on these hypotheses. And you see here the disappearance of uh, direct gas boilers, which will be replaced in the future by heat pumps and cogeneration and district heating for the set of hypotheses that we have, um, that we have uh, chosen and that we have varied. And what is important in our approach is that we can optimize the natural gas network as, as a result of these uh, constraints. And you see that the natural gas network maintains its net backbone and maintains its redundancy. However, of course, the overall mesh and length of this network gets decreased. And in fact, the, the optimization process even allows you to optimally choose the location of both CHP and um, uh, heat pump distribution over the territory. And in fact, our calculations show that up to 50% of the new electricity demand due to heat pumps can be covered by cogeneration uh, that replace direct gas boilers on an optimized natural gas network. And this is extremely important in terms of stability for the electricity network. So you see that the overall length of the gas network, of course, decreases. But this gas network, in fact, is used to ensure the stability and to ensure covering the new demand coming from heat pumps. So the two uh, networks working together. And even by considering purely fossil natural gas, which will not be the case, of course, more and more green gases will be injected in the grid. Uh, you see that the CO2 emissions based on this uh, intelligent use of uh, both heat pumps and cogeneration can lead to substantial CO2 decrease. And this is only with fossil natural gas, of course, in the future will be more green gases. And I'm now finishing. This is my conclusion. I'm, I've tried to show you that network convergence is, in fact, a solution set that will allow facing the challenges both uh, in the short and medium term. Network convergence gains answers and also increases supply security. It is also an investment of optimization and Thank can you. give rise to new business models. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Capezzali. And we'll continue with um, a presentation by Professor Li Gang Wang from North China Electric Power University. Uh, Li Gang Wang, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello to everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be invited. And it's very nice to follow uh, the previous talk on Power to X. So here my talk will be about reversible solid oxide cell technology. And first, I would like to give some words on my university, uh, since it's quite, uh, well, most of you are not very familiar with the, with the university. Uh, SEPU is very specific to energy and power. It was jointly by ministry, uh, built by Ministry of Education and the University, university Council, uh, which includes 12 mega power groups and the China Electrical 
uh, console. So those are the major players in energy power field in China. The Sense APU has a very strong collaboration with them. Oh, sorry. And uh, now uh, NCEPU has three national platforms. The most important is the state key laboratory of uh, power systems, two others on biomass power and thermal power. And uh, uh, well, for the China energy transition, the university now is firmly moving into uh, energy storage. And since this year, we will build a national platform with a total budget of 100 million euro. Uh, NCEPU will have a strong speed up of electrochemical storage and uh, hydrogen research in the following years. Uh, with this outlook, I rejoined NCPU after years in Europe and the leader group now on solar outside technology. In the past six years, I have worked closely with multiple groups uh, of EPFO and uh, further taking the opportunity of 12 uh, European projects uh, to link with more than 40 units in Europe. In the future, NCPU will further enhance uh, uh, the collaboration with Switzerland and uh, Europe. And in fact, there have already been quite intensive high level interactions between NCPU and the EPFO with the support of Swiss Next and the China Most. So for the technical part, I will focus on the identification of potential application scenarios of a solid oxide technology. So a solid oxide uh, fuel cell uh, is made of a ceramide uh, with oxygen ions transport through the electrolyte. It works at uh, 650 and to 800 uh, 50 uh, degree it involves a high efficiency and compared with the low temperature fuel cell and the electrolyzer solid oxide technology may be more suitable for energy field due to uh, like reversible operation uh, one stack can switch between the fuel cell mode and the electrolyzer mode which is essential to enable power generation and storage while with one single unit it can involve very high efficiency and high chemical flexibility uh, it works with not only hydrogen, but a lot of other fuels uh, long lifetime and potentially low cost. However, the system is quite complex and uh, with slow uh, dynamics. So uh, for the te te technology readiness level, SFC small CHP system has reached the early commercialization in Japan and Europe. Uh, so you see power to hydrogen now is led by Europe and it reaches TRL 6 to 8 and is moving towards a megawatt level large demonstration. However, the major difficulty is still to find economic feasible application scenarios since the technology is still quite expensive. So for SFC application, the target competitors are PV or PV plus battery. To reach PV electricity cost in the future, uh, we predict that SFC system investment cost need to be below 200 euro per kilowatt, which might happen after 10 to 15 years. For Power2X directly using wind power and PV, it is important to mention that for a given installation capacity of wind power uh, or renewable power, the smaller the electrolyzer, the higher the annual operating hours will be. So here we take the example of a 10 megawatt electrolyzer installed for a 100 megawatt wind power. The annual operating hours are around 6,000, which is quite high though. But the, the calculated levelized uh, chemical product cost is still higher than the market price in the long run. It might be only possible to be really cost competitive after 2035. Therefore, single mode SFC and SOEC system will still be struggling for economic business cases in near term. And then how about reversible solid oxide system? Uh, well, we took these two uh, scenarios. First, uh, RSOC could be stored in wind farms as on-site storage. And the purpose is not to generate hydrogen, but to enhance the wind power reliability. With the system installed, when the actual power is higher than the dispatched power, the additional power could be stored as chemical. And in turn, these chemicals could be converted to power for the grid. Therefore, the difference of actual and dispatched power, that is, uh, for example, wind curtailment, and imbalance penalty can be reduced. Except for RSOC system, there can be other options like a, a lithium battery or a separate fuel cell and the electrolyzer system. We have evaluated uh, uh, more than 3,000 scenarios with uncertainty analysis and found that among these three options, RSOC system showing the best economic performance with 34% 30, uh, scenarios earning a profit of over 12,000 euro per megawatt wind power, while battery and uh, 
separate fuel cell and electrolyzer option mostly below this number. The ISOC system enhances wind power reliability the most, over 90% for 60% scenarios, while battery and separate fuel cell plus uh, electrolyzer option performs much lower. And here, in this case, uh, system dynamics is not considered, particularly uh, load shifting and hot standby. This leads to our recent outcome of triple mode, grid balancing plant concept, which avoids load shifting and uh, standby. We combine biomass gasification and RSOC technology. The same gas produced from biomass could be converted into uh, in the RSOC to electricity or methane. If the grid has power shortage, the plant will generate power. If the grid has power supplies, then the plant will store excess grid power to convert biomass into methane. If the grid is somehow balanced, a power neutral mode with methane production will be used with no grid interaction. So thus conceptually, this concept can enable mode switch and the full load at all time and high any operating hours with no standby. The economic evaluation considers all aspects from grid flexibility needs, uh, biomass supply chain, uh, plant design, sizing, and scheduling. We have evaluated more than 30 key studies in Denmark and south of Italy and found that the operating hours of power generation and power storage mode is the major indicator of economic feasibility. When it is higher than 4,000 hours, which means the plant has high grid uh, balancing priority, the key study can be highly economic feasible. And the total plant sizes reach over uh, 50 megawatts in power generation mode. Therefore, we foresee this concept as an important pathway for future large scale deployment of SOC technology. To conclude, and now NCPU is moving firmly to energy storage and we look for uh, and are also promoting long and uh, strong collaboration with the Switzerland and Europe. There is a strong need of enhancing R&D uh, in the ISOC technology so that promote its application for on-site storage and grid balancing. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, Wang. And we'll continue now with a, another Swiss perspective, uh, Dr. Christian Schaffner, Executive uh, Director of the Energy Science Center at ETH Zurich is up next. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks a lot for having me here today. Um, I'm very delighted uh, to give a presentation, a very short presentation about one uh, thing we are doing in, in Switzerland at the Energy Science Center. Um, if you listen to the talk so far, I think it's clear that the, the energy system and in particular the electricity system will face uh, major changes. And it's not only about the uh, share of different resources that will produce electricity, it's really also about how this everything all gets together, works together and will work as um, uh, a system. So let me share um, my uh, slides here. Um, so I want to, to show you a, a project that we have been doing where we try to actually look at the future uh, system and how a high share of renewables will influence or will play together with other storage options such as hydropower or battery storage. And what we did there is that we recreated a new system from scratch, a modeling system to model the energy system with a focus on the electricity system. And if you, if you realize that a lot of changes will happen in the distribution system, as we have heard in the previous talks, it's clear that to model the overall system, you also need to take into account uh, this decentralized um, system. So what we did here is that we included all uh, distribution and production system from bottom up. So from a techno-economic uh, uh, point of view, we have the transmission infrastructure and also the distribution uh, systems in there. But then what we also included, and this is quite unique, is that we also included a macroeconomic analysis of the system, because at the end, uh, the technology by itself does not help. We definitely also need the investors. We need uh, to see how these different um, changes in the system influence the economy at large, influence the different uh, domains. And uh, so what we did is we um, created an integrated 
model with bottom-up and top-down approaches. The modeling framework um, is transparent, so it will be shared uh, as open source. Uh, it's not yet done, but it will come soon. It has clearly defined interfaces between um, very distinct modules. And um, I'm only going very quickly through these modules. We are modeling the electricity system, as I said, on the distribution side with uh, generation, local PV, batteries, electric vehicles, etc. At the transmission and dispatch uh, level, where we look at um, uh, how the, the power flows will actually work, how the grids uh, influence the system. Um, and then we also have the energy market. So this is more a classical setup, uh, a fundamental um, model. We then add, as I said, the top-down approach where we have the economy there, the macroeconomics, and we also do add system security. So to really understand does our system, how we model it, how we do the scenarios even work and or could even work. And what you see here in the different axes that we have a very large um, difference between the time resolution. So at system security, of course, very short uh, minutes, uh, 15 minutes. And then at macroeconomics, we're looking at uh, years or decades. And also a level of aggregation. We have a distribution system here, uh, very local. And then, of course, have the overall economy at the large scale. So um, we could, of course, talk a very long time about these models. Um, it's all online. You can read about it. But let me go into some results. And what we did is we looked at Switzerland, but included in the European system. So the results you see here, only the results for Switzerland, but the surrounding countries and the interconnection with the surrounding countries uh, are included in the model. And what you see here is the change of um, production um, and, and seasonal behavior in the year 2020, 2030, and 2050. And one big change you see, of course, is here in, in orange, that's the nuclear power um, that is being phased out. So 2050, we won't have any nuclear power in the system anymore, but instead we will have, and that's the green part here, high shares of renewables. What you also see is that Switzerland is, as uh, was also said by Benoit Reva at the beginning, very well interconnected with the European system. So we have imports here, the, the dark gray, and we have um, exports here. So in winter today, we import a lot, in summer we export. And this also happens in the future, however, more distinct. So we will have more exchange even due to the high share of PV. Um, now, th these graphs are interesting, but they don't show the full picture yet. So you don't, can't really see yet how, for example, storage plays a role. And if we go more into the details, if you look at um, hourly values, that's when it becomes really interesting. And again, I'm showing here the year 2020 for Switzerland and 2050. Now, both for a typical winter week and a typical summer week. And you see today, uh, we have a nuclear power being more or less a base load, some reductions in, in summer. Um, but, and then in addition to that, we have the runoff river here, the dark blue, we have the pumped hydro storage here, the, the dams in, in this lighter blue. And then we have some PV coming in from time to time. And uh, we have here some pumping and, and uh, activity going on due to, to market behavior in, in the European market. So that's a typical winter day. In summer, you see that we have today a little bit more of PV there are days where we actually um, have quite a lot of, of import export activities also due to pumping. What you see in red here, this red fine line, this is the net load. So it's basically all the load uh, that is, is remaining if you take, um, if you take away the, the dispatchable um, production. Now, if you just, let me go back to, to one slide here. Again, like just to remind ourselves the difference from 2020 to 2050, when I mean, you see the change from nuclear to, to, um, to PV, but otherwise the system is not that much different or at least like similar behavior, right? And, but now if we go into the details here um, and compare 2020 to now 2050, you see a completely different picture. Well, first the nuclear power is gone, the, the, the orange part. But now we have um, a behavior, for example, from the, the, the um, 
pumped hydro dams that is completely different from 2020, where here we had more weekly behavior. So shifting energy from one week to, to the next, some day and night activities in 2050, due to the high share of, of PV, both in winter and in summer, we suddenly have a behavior from pumped hydro that is, is really uh, producing, um, so a turbining at uh, night and and uh, pumping during the day. What you see, what you see also here in the red in the red parts here. That's the pumping power, and this is happening every day. And in in winter, we don't have much pumping, of course, because uh, there is not enough uh, energy in Switzerland. But you also see that the the red line here, the net load, now has huge um, has huge uh, flexibility, huge variability, and this can now be, be handled by hydro and also battery storage that come in. I didn't include battery storage here because of time limits, but we could also show this, of course, later. So let me let me go to the end. Um, uh, this very, very quickly, Dr. Yes, Schaffer, I'm, I'm, I'm at the end. So um, all these results can be looked at at this this uh, uh, web page here. I'm not going showing here. But I think what is really interesting is that if we look into the future, we will have a completely different system, different production, but also completely different behavior of our systems. And I think this we need to tackle by storage, by having new fuels, et cetera, that was already mentioned before. So uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schaffner. And from Zurich, we go to Lausanne now. Please welcome Professor Francois Maréchal, Head of Industrial Process and Energy Systems Engineering at EPFL. Uh, the stage is yours. Um. Okay, so welcome everyone. So my name is François Maréchal. I'm a professor in EPFL. Um, I hope that you see my screen now. Um, so I'm going to discuss now the, uh, the contributions that we do in the uh, Swiss energy innovation by applying techniques from industrial process and energy systems engineering. So what does it mean? It means that we would like to develop models that helps people deciding what is the design of the future energy system. So what does it mean? It means that we have to help the people first to understand the needs. So, so you have citizens and citizens have uh, behaviors that are going to change, the number of people are going to change, the needs are going to change, and perhaps also the definition of the needs. So different types of service that are related to satisfying the needs, for example, mobility or comfort. So what we have to do then is to understand first where are the renewable re energy resources that we have, uh, where they are, when they are available, and how much are available. And then afterwards, we have to decide the investment, so the equipment that needs to be invested in such a way that we will uh, have the future energy system. And for doing this, then we have to identify what are the technologies and their sizes. And typically, we have to look at new technologies, not all technologies, but the new one, and the way that they will be interacting uh, in systems and therefore uh, looking at the capacity that they have to exchange uh, via the infrastructure that needs to be developed. But once I'm developing infrastructure, there will be something which is very important, which are the storage tanks that needs to be managed. So it means that if I have to do the design, I need to define the size, I need to define how the technologies are interconnected and how they will be operated for a given purpose that is not only the economical uh, 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 profit, but also the environmental impact that needs to be uh, reduced. Of course, we have also to take into account the fact that the system has to be uh, resilient and we have to guarantee the security of supply. And today we are also looking at uh, a system that is not only looking at the energy, but all the needs of the society, including the waste management and the waste can be converted into products. The carbon management and the carbon can be converted into products, and we have already had some uh, uh, proof of it, and the waste that can become an energy source. And at the end, we will have also to look if 
there is uh, what is the level of uh, sequestration. So we have to make this uh, full design. And for doing this, then we develop models. So we develop models that are going to uh, assemble the technological options that we have in databases that are to be interconnected and to create a, an integrated systems that needs to be evaluated. And for doing this, then we use computers. So instead of uh, generating uh, scenarios uh, by our, uh, by, by typical approaches, what we are going to do is that we are going to ask computers to look at the decision space and extract what are the interesting solutions that we will analyze and that we will, so, so that at the end we will be able to propose solutions with the uh, metrics that allows us to justify why we take one decision and not another one. So what is behind this is first, the, the, the understanding of the thermodynamics. And it has already been shown, for example, that heat pumps is a very nice way to supply heat to buildings. 90% of the energy then can come from the uh, environment directly. And then we have to look at how we integrate this into a system. So I can integrate a heat pump in a building, put PV panels on the roofs in order to produce electricity. And then I realize that I need at the same time that I have considered the, the technologies, I need the grid. I need the grid to supply the electricity when the sun is not shining, and I need the grid to take the electricity that I have in excess when the sun is shining too much. I will have also to integrate the optimal management of the system in order to try to phase, to, to coordinate the availability of the, of the solar energy and the usage inside the building. So it means that I will need to know when the people are there, when they will use the energy and when the sun is shining so that I will be able to make this coordination. Once I'm doing this, then I'm optimize the self-consumption inside the system. And this has a big impact because I can then reduce more than 90% the carbon dioxide emissions related to the building sector. Uh, I still have to supply some uh, uh, remaining electricity to the system. And this can be done by using the waste that I'm generating. So for example, waste biomass can be converted as uh, uh, in, in form of synthetic natural gas that can be stored and distributed for being used when the uh, electricity is needed, for example, for driving the heat pumps. And of course, I will do an integration effort because I will try to reuse the waste heat that is related to the production or to the conversion processes. At the same time, I realize that I have too much electricity and you have seen by the presentation of Professor Wang that uh, uh, electrolysis can be a good way to produce a fuel from an excess of electricity. So provided that I have this excess, then I can produce the fuel and I will use carbon dioxide as a, as a source of uh, storage of the uh, excess of electricity. And then I'm going again to introduce the, the system of integration. So I'm, I'm going to look at the biomass conversion. It produces natural gas, but the byproduct, the byproduct is carbon dioxide, meaning that if I have an excess of electricity on the grid, then I can produce more methane. Uh, if I have this system, then I realize that the best would be perhaps to reduce the amount of electricity that is needed in the uh, heat pump. And this is the next step, so understanding where I can harvest the efficiency. So if I'm thinking about uh, a heat pump, then I have to look at where I have heat sources. And the idea there that we are developing is the use of a low temperature district heating system using carbon dioxide that is going to vaporize or condense that is allowing us to harvest the heat uh, the waste heat of the industry after having produced the electricity, harvest the low grade heat from data centers of wastewater, for example, that can buy directly be reused or use a, a first heat pump to harvest the heat from the environment or from refrigeration cycles and then distribute it to the right place. And this allows me to have a system that is that has on the one hand decentralized energy harvesting and on the other hand decentralized heat uh, supply. Now, if I'm integrating this with the PV production, and if I'm looking at the whole city, then I will have a system that is going to harvest heat when the heat is, uh, where the heat is available, distribute the heat at the place where it has to be uh, distributed, use grids, which will be the gas grid, the electrical grid, the district heating cooling systems, and the waste management in order to be able to convert the waste into energy, to convert excess power into gas, and convert the deficit of 
power uh, from the gas to uh, the power. So integrating the energy management allows me to integrate uh, cities. Uh, we have shown that in the city center of Geneva, for example, we were able to, to reduce by, by 84% the energy consumption to supply the city, and we had economical profit. At the end, so we can do the same approach in the industry, identifying places where we can do efficiency measures, identifying how to integrate processes one with the other to recover the heat, to share equipments, and to integrate the waste management into uh, the system. And finally, we can also consider the integration of carbon. So we can take the well, biomass, that's produce- that's Yes. We are up with time. I'm very sorry. Thank you very much uh, for your insights. Um, we're ending the academic presentation round now with another Chinese view. Um, you can end your sharing. Thank you very much. I'd like uh, to welcome Professor Zheng Yan for Electric Engineering at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. The stage is yours. Uh, hello. Uh, can you see my uh, slides? Yes, uh, yes. Okay, uh, Maybe full screen. Uh, good morning, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, in Shanghai, it's uh, afternoon. Uh, uh, today, uh, I will give a presentation about mobile energy storage in uh, electric power grid. And this speech uh, is uh, about the uh, value and prospect of mobile energy system in city grids and the background of energy transition in China. Uh, to cope with the uh, uh, climate warming problem and promote the energy transition, the Chinese government proposed carbon dioxide emission peak before 2030 and the carbon neutrality before 2060 in China. In recent years, the capacity of renewable energy keeps increasing. Uh, before 2030, the capacity of renewable energy will be over 1,200 gigawatts. At the same time, electric vehicles are taking the place of gasoline cars. However, uh, the power of renewable energy is variable and intermittent, which challenges the grid operation and its reliability and are threatened by the renewable energy. And this big bound energy storage is needed to help the integration of large scale renewable energy. Uh, and uh, it's expected to play a crucial role in a low carbon transition of our energy system. And in big city like Shanghai, uh, mobile energy system is carried on track, which include plug-in interface and the control systems. There are some advantage of mobile energy storage uh, is uh, uh, mobility in different locations and it can provide a special temporal power shift and uh, it's cost effectiveness because uh, it, its cost can be shared by uh, different users. Uh, um, on the other hand, and the stationary uh, energy storage is uh, location limitations and the lower utilization rate. And the mobile energy system in uh, Shanghai, and uh, uh, the reason is that we have rare space uh, for stationary energy storage. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we have uh, developed a transportation network. Uh, so this help uh, to promote the application of mobile energy storage. Uh, and it's more uh, expected that in power grid of Shanghai and the similar cities, uh, you can uh, apply it uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the generation side, in grid side, or even in demand side uh, for uh, uh, promote the uh, integrated energy system. The, uh, about the uh, mobile energy system uh, operations scheme, uh, it's, uh, you can apply uh, uh, a big lower uh, in power network. Uh, congestions and, and uh, it also we can benefit uh, from the mobile energy system. Uh, uh, for example, and 
in renewable energy integration and uh, in to improve the resilience uh, of the system. The uh, operation mode of mobile energy system include uh, uh, usually uh, three modes. If uh, it is in a travel condition, it is unconnected to the system. But if you reach a destination, usually and you have three state, one is discharge, another is charge, two and idle. Uh, this is a, a three and a stay. Um, its function include uh, relieving power grid congestion. Uh, in this uh, 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 fig, we can see that uh, if we have uh, power grid congested, and then the mobile uh, energy can be moved to either the source side or to the load side, and so that to help the uh, system to relieve congestion. And in the meantime, uh, because uh, this uh, introduction of mobile energy, uh, the city can reduce the grid expansion cost uh, because uh, uh, the mobile energy system compare the construction of power transmission line can be much, much uh, cost effective. And you can also uh, provide a renewable energy integration uh, in the uh, city, because we know that uh, wind power plants and the solar power plants have different characteristics, and the power of wind plants is usually uh, high at the night, uh, while the solar plants uh, behave better uh, in daytime. Thus, uh, mobile energy system can share in different uh, types of renewable energy in different time, different location, uh, so that to improve the integration of uh, renewable energy in total. It can also uh, use uh, to help uh, for power grid resilience, uh, for example, uh, to improve uh, uh, the recovery of uh, energy supply. Uh, in this figure, we can see that if, if we use um, a stationary energy uh, system, uh, because it's fixed in one place, and then it will be hard uh, to uh, recover the whole system. But if we, we have a uh, mobile energy system, and then it can be organized in, uh, in such a way so that um, the micro -grid, uh, grid can be formed in the process of recovery so that uh, it can improve the recovery efficiency. Uh, and now I will uh, talk about the uh, uh, mobile energy system. Uh, it's a modeling in smart city. Uh, I introduced uh, two cases. And one case is uh, about uh, transmission network modeling together with uh, power system, uh, specifically distribution network modeling. And the travel time uh, in this trans, uh, transportation network modeling, uh, we need to uh, consider the uh, power traffic and uh, the traffic load constraint. And we also need to uh, consider the power grid uh, modeling constraint, like the power flow balance, security constraint, and the mobile energy constraint. And, and then we uh, put uh, these two uh, constraints together to solve a uh, mobile energy system scheduling uh, problem. This is a highly uh, uh, no linear mathematical uh, problem. And, and uh, here I give some uh, result. Uh, we compare four uh, scheme methods and can show that the mobile energy system with a dynamic schedule can have a uh, uh, relatively uh, cheap cost compared with the other scheduling method. Uh, I will click uh, skip to the, to the end of uh, the conclusion. Uh, uh, mobile very, energy system. Very quick, provide... Professor Yan, uh, okay. the time is actually up. <laughs> Okay. Mm. Thank you. Uh, okay, Thank that's you. the end. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, the conclusion people can still maybe quickly read. Thank you very much, um, Professor Yan. So, from, 
So from academia, we now move over to how to put knowledge into practice and exploring new ideas. You will now hear four short pitches by startups. And let's start with Dr. Paolo Romano, CEO and co-founder of Safiro. Hello, everyone. My name is Paolo, and I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Zafiro Technologies. Zafiro is an innovative company in the smart grid domain. We help today several electrical utilities worldwide to increase the resiliency and reliability of their power grids in order to prepare them for the upcoming clean energy transition. Rooftop solar, wind farms, distributed storage, EV charging station. All these new energy solutions represent the future of our energy system, but in order to provide their benefits, they always require a connection to a power grid that can reliably and efficiently transport the energy from a generation unit to a consumer. In particular, the first step to transform a classical grid into a smart grid is to enable visibility. At Zafiro, we do this in a very unique way. Our software solution, SyncroGuard indeed, is the only one relaying on the most advanced grid monitoring technology currently available, phasor measurement units, and combine this with advanced algorithms to enable full grid visibility with only 20% of the grid nodes being monitored. Not only, SyncroGuard is also able to reduce by up to 80% the duration and frequency of blackouts, or to integrate 300% more renewables without any expensive grid reinforcement via automatic control of utility scale batteries. And last but not least, it is characterized by the simplest installation on the market. Today, our solution has been adopted by some of the biggest utilities worldwide, including China Light and Power in Hong Kong and Comet in the United States. This has allowed to attract some of the most prominent investors in the energy domain, and we are very excited to announce soon our partnership with one of the biggest players in this industry. If you're interested to know more about this and our Series A round, feel free to reach out to us via the email address you see in this slide. Thanks a lot to all of you and happy to talk to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Romano. And we go uh, to the next uh, pitch, uh, Tommaso Miori, uh, international business developer at Electricity, who is also a VATDOR winner. The stage is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Tommaso Miori, and I am responsible for international markets at Adaptricity. And I'm happy to present to you our company today. So Adaptricity is a software startup based in Zurich, and we provide software tools to optimize distribution grids. We have three main products, which are in the center of the slide, Adaptricity Plan, Same and Mon. Adaptricity Plan is a very intuitive tool to provide standard planning processes. Adaptricity SIM instead makes a step further and utilizes the real data from the smart meters, for example, to simulate the future of the grids with future scenarios. And Adaptricity MON is a monitoring tool where the user can see the latest stages of the grid using the latest data from the smart meters. Adaptricity is taking the data, for example, from the GIS, from the measurements, from the ERP, and integrating all the data automatically into the platform. We work mainly with DSOs. We have more than 80 customers worldwide. Now we are a seven years old startup and we work with different departments from these DSOs. Example of customers are E.ON or Stadtwerk Winterthur in Switzerland, LKW in Liechtenstein, uh, and Allsnet and China Light and Power in Australia and Hong Kong for a more international uh, background. We also work in several R&D and innovation projects. So if we have to state really the main benefits that the platform brings to our uh, customers, the first one is definitely the optimization of grid investments. So by knowing the current and the future state of, of the grids, the DSOs can optimize the grid investments. Second point, we allow reducing operational costs because we can make the processes more efficient. Third point, we can really help DSOs to increase the share of renewables and e-mobility in the grid. For example, because electricity is really focused on the integration of new DERs in the grid. So thank you very much for your attention and we are available for any further information or question that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And up next is Philippe Bieri, CEO and co-founder of Gelitics. Ni hao, wo hengao sing ren shenin, 
我叫菲利普，今天我要介绍你们 Chilitics。Chilitics 是一家来自瑞士的软件公司。Hi, my name is Philip. We are from Chilitics, and I am happy to introduce you today to、uh, our software, which helps you to optimize infrastructure planning. So I'm talking about power lines, railways, streets, but also renewable energy. So our goal is to find optimal position for such linear infrastructure, and how we do that is by offering a software, which helps you to use spatial data, like residential areas, like other infrastructure, and adapt them to your needs by selecting different parameters, planning parameters, and then create、uh, various options of infrastructure. Uh, designs. After that, you can review multiple analytics like costs, lengths, and which are the optimal positions of different designs. Once you calculate the different options, you can make decisions by looking into a 3D world and even manually change designs, so you are able to communicate to your planning team, but also to landowners or authorities how your design actually looks like. We're very happy to introduce you Chilitics today, and we are looking for partners or customers in China. And if you are connected to a infrastructure company or an engineering company, please get in touch with us. We are very happy to follow up and have first discussions. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any kind of questions. Thank you. And up next is Gino Akpomemeva, a CEO and co-founder of Climac. Hi, my name is Gino, and I am the CEO of Climac, a startup based in Zurich, co-founded in 2017 by five ETH engineers with a background in industry and sales. Did you know that in the energy data there are hidden treasures? Climac is the map to find them. We contribute to a sustainable future by processing and enriching data from smart meters and IoT devices, opening new perspectives for the clever usage of energy data, which were not imaginable before the advent of machine learning. Our scalable solution aimed at Swiss energy and metering providers improves customer engagement, generates hints for operational optimizations, and advices to increase efficiency. With our solution, providers save time and money. We are the only one offering a complete ecosystem, combining a submetering IoT device with automated analytics and our innovative load disaggregation technology, making for a stronger USP. There are already numerous customers, and we can demonstrate the growing revenues on the Swiss market. And we believe that the success of Climap is based on a great team, but also on the investors who support it. So next time that you receive your energy bill. Think what your footprint is and what you can do for a more sustainable future. Think of Climap. We are the clever solution for you. And from innovative ideas into how it's being implemented, we'll hear now the perspectives of industry leaders. And we'd like to start with Dr. Martin Nedele, head of research at Hitachi ABB Power Grids. Thank you very much. Today, I would like to share with you our thoughts in Hitachi ABB Power Grids about the transformation needs of the power system in order to support the energy transition and a carbon neutral future. The electric grid has served as well to improve the standard of living all over the world in the past 200 years. As we have heard already a couple of times today, in the coming years between now and the middle of the century. Uh, the energy transition towards a carbon-neutral energy system will create one of the biggest changes the electric grid has encountered in its history. We see three major building blocks to tackle this change. First, an accelerated shift from fossil-based to renewable power generation. Second, the growing electrification. Of other sectors, like transportation, like industry, and buildings. 
And thirdly, wherever the direct use of electricity is not efficient or not even feasible, the augmentation of the electric system with other sustainable energy carriers like green hydrogen. In order to do this, we see from a technology perspective, a number of challenges that need to be overcome. The biggest are first an increased need for transmission and distribution grid capacity, accommodating bi-directional power flows. And this need is driven by the overall increase of electric energy flowing through the grid, for example, uh, due to EVs, due to increased electrification of buildings and industry, and also new major consumers like data centers, which in some areas already are a significant part of the demand. And this will overall result in a doubling of the electrical energy demand by 2050 from 20 to 40% as part of the share or a share of the total energy demand in some regions significantly beyond that. And all that against the background of a still increasing uh, global overall demand. In addition to this general capacity extension, we also need uh, grid capacity to connect bulk renewables to the load centers. The load centers are typically metropolitan areas or industrial areas, whereas you find the bulk renewables in places where you have lots of wind, lots of, or lots of sun or both. And that's normally deserts, mountainous areas or offshore. And we need sufficient uh, transmission capacity to connect those. On the other side of the spectrum, and we have also heard about that already uh, quite a few times today, we have the distributed renewable energy sources, uh, very, very many of them, hundred thousands, on the leaf end of the distribution grid. And they also need to be connected and they need to be able to contribute to the energy demand of the bigger grid and that was a distribution grid, which originally was designed for a different uh, direction of energy flow. So a lot of challenges around adapting the grid to dealing with this new energy system. In addition to that, we also need to deal overall with the increased complexity of an increased and variable generation and matching that to an equally increasing and variable demand. And that requires new technological solutions. For example, on inter-area connectivity using technologies like high voltage DC to make use of the differences between different geographic regions, for example, uh, due to time zone differences or other geographic differences to balance demand and generation. And this needs to be augmented by battery and energy storage uh, to um, shave off the peak load and to fill in gaps in variable generation. In addition to this, we need control and protection solutions for these new grids that are driven by power electric converters rather than rotating generators. And this includes solutions for grid forming control where grid voltage and frequency are created and maintained completely without any rotating machines. Power electronics is the key technology to make this possible. In addition, we need digital control solutions on different timescales to optimize the grid from the economic perspective of the stakeholders and also from a reliability and resilience perspective. Digital technologies like Internet of Things, cloud, big data, data analytics, machine learning, AI, simulation, digital twins, and also mathematical optimization are the key to make this possible. And you must also not forget wherever we are controlling a critical infrastructure like the power grid by means of digital systems, be it um, remote centralized systems or local decentralized systems. Cybersecurity is also absolutely essential. 
And all of this are the topics that we are working on in Hitachi ABB Power Grids research in our global research centers, including our research teams and our R&D teams in China and Switzerland. So if we bring the right solutions together, we can achieve an energy system that is carbon neutral and sustainable, that is affordable and brings economic benefits to producers and consumers, which increasingly may be the same people, that is flexible for future needs and opportunities, and last but not least, is more reliable and more resilient than the grid we have today. In summary, in Hitachi ABB Power Grids, we believe that electricity will be the backbone of the entire energy system and that any energy unit One minute will left. have been electrical at least once. This way, we will solve the fundamental societal problem to get the energy system as backbone of our civilization ready for future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nedele. <laughs> and sorry for interrupting in between. Um, and up next is uh, Markus Halder, head of uh, the Power Demand Management Program at the Swiss Federal Railways. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, to all, so a warm welcome from my side. Uh, thank you for the ability to present the Power Demand Management Program from Swiss Federal Railways. The next slide. I, I'm working at SBB Energy. We are the power provider for the railways, in the main railway line in Switzerland. So we own our own power plants and a high voltage system. And we are connected to the public grid uh, via frequency converters as our own network has its own um, different uh, frequency. And uh, you see this train down there. Uh, there are more and more of them. In the next slide, you can see that growth of traffic uh, is huge in uh, Switzerland, growth of uh, rail traffic, and we expect the further growth up to 2030, which will re result also in a growth of um, energy demand in the next slide. So we, we could, uh, yeah, we expect up to 2030 25% more energy demand. And the trains, they will be more powerful. They will run more at the um, yeah, rush hours. So at peak times, we, we even expect up to 40% additional energy demand. There, we have the alternative to invest in more power plants, more infrastructure, or we um, decided to an alternative option to invest in energy saving or uh, for the uh, power peaks uh, to invest in, um, in power um, uh, management. So that are two programs and I want to concentrate now on the uh, power demand management program. There's a small video explaining this program, which has the objective to save 20% to shift 20% of our maximum peaks. So please uh, start the video. Train travel is environmentally friendly. SBB's trains are powered by electricity, 90% of which is generated by hydropower, and they are very energy efficient. In order to be able to transport large quantities of passengers and goods at the same time, they need high driving power. SBB's synchronized timetable means that lots of trains accelerate at the same time. At these times, the demand for power in the rail power network increases significantly. Deploying additional coaches and trains during rush hour raises the demand for power even further. In winter, an additional power demand comes from the heating of trains and points. When a particularly high amount of power is needed all at once, this causes very high peak loads in the rail power network for a short time. To make sure the network remains stable even in these situations, systems such as power plants and frequency converters must be capable of managing the peak loads at any time. But what will happen in the future when there are even more trains that are even more powerful than before, so that peak loads are even higher? 
will we have to invest in new plant and equipment? These don't come cheap. SBB has therefore developed an innovative solution to the peak loads problem. A piece of software recognizes when a critical value is exceeded. Power consumers such as heaters are then deliberately switched off for a short time. The customers don't notice anything. The temperature inside the coaches doesn't change. The energy requirement is only shifted by a couple of seconds, up to a maximum of two minutes. With its load management innovation program, SBB is determined to cut costs and increase reliability in the rail power supply, while also contributing to Switzerland's energy strategy. Thank you. So um, after this video, I want to give some more information about the uh, background of the power demand management program. Uh, you can see here two graphs. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a daily uh, profile. It's up to 24, even if I see that uh, X scale was a bit uh, shifted. Um, so uh, what, what, what do you think, what's the idea? Uh, What's your idea what could be displayed here? It's on the left side, um, you see um, the daily profile uh, of the electricity consumption of a Zurich city. And on the right hand, the one from the railways in Switzerland, uh, one day at SPB, uh, you see it's much more dynamic, uh, the power profile. Um, and if we focus on that curve, you can also see some systematic fluctuations. Uh, they are due to our systematic timetable to the full hour or half hour, the trains are in the st main stations, consume less power and in between, especially when they are at higher speed accelerating, they con uh, consume uh, much more electricity. So power demand is rising. And there are some stochastical parts in there. So you can see sometimes there are extreme peaks. Here in this graph, it's around at eight, nine o'clock, uh, a very extreme peak. And in the next slide, um, you see that we, we have to cover uh, this power demand in every second uh, from SPB Energy. So we have our hydropower plants and if power demand is rising, we have to invest in additional frequency converters to, to cover this demand and uh, to invest in an additional uh, power band would be much more expensive than just avoiding those very extreme peaks. They are just a few seconds, a few times a year. And so we decided to invest in the software to, to, to shave those peaks. Um, next slide. Um, the software uh, that we've developed uh, has an interface to our energy management system. And when a threshold is exceeded, um, it automatically switches off um, heaters on our train cars or heaters on the switch heaters, point heaters in our network. And that's uh, in real time, it's based on SAP Hina, the, uh, bait, um, platform with smart data streaming uh, that allows us, us to, to shift off thousands of uh, heaters in a special algorithm. Yeah, that's what we're doing at the moment, what we what we have done uh, or, or where we are at the moment as a short One outlook. minute left. Yeah, short outlook, what we're working on in the future. Next slide is uh, we uh, work on uh, using this uh, platform also to overload protection, then to integrate uh, batteries in our network. Uh, they will come to a huge number when we electrify our diesel trains. Then uh, on an ideal stage to have a continuous compensation of the power fluctuations with a predict predictive heating and cooling, and then even a control of traction power demand. And to conclude the final slide, um, yeah, the virtual power plant has already become reality uh, for SBB. It's a cost efficient answer to cope with our extreme power peaks. Um, the, uh, it enhances also uh, supports our business continuity management and it's all uh, with the smart grid approach, uh, a support to Switzerland's long-term energy strategy. Perfect, just in Thank time. You. Thank you. <laughs> um, and up next, we have Min Yuan, a Vice Director of Sales and Director of Overseas Department at Aue Technology De Development and co the stage is yours. Thank you very much. 
Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And we can um, see you. Perfect. Um, uh, we we are located in Shanghai. The name of the company is Shanghai Away Technology Development uh, Com Company Limited. Um, uh, next, uh, the company was founded in 1998 uh, with the registered capital of 60 million RMB. Um, we have two um, facilities. One is uh, for R&D, which covers 7,000 square meters, and the other one is for production. Um, so we started the company as a R&D company, and uh, after um, almost 10 years, we started to um, have uh, products and have applications. And the products in the company have um, passed um, uh, numerous uh, certificates on, on uh, CE, uh, TUV, and, and the company's uh, com and compliance with uh, ISO uh, management. Uh, next slide. Um, the main product of our way is ultra capacitor. Um, ultra capacitor is like uh, uh, the working like a battery, but it's uh, in uh, a few ways different. As you could see on the right, the purple part, uh, the, I'm sorry, the pink part is a supercapacitor, a typical uh, supercapacitor. Um, it has very high energy density and its cycle life um, up, is up to 10, uh, 100,000 to uh, 1 million cycles. And uh, our goal is to, um, to make, make our product um, still maintaining the power density of ultra capacitor or super capacitor, but in, uh, we increase the energy density tremendously. Uh, right now, uh, we, uh, the green part is our product. So our energy density is uh, very close to um, battery. Uh, right now is a half of um, uh, of battery is around uh, 90 to 100 watt hour per kilogram. Um, some uh, features of our product, uh, we have very fast charge discharge capability. Uh, our working temperature windows very range from minus 40 to 65 uh, plus. And uh, we have, uh, we maintain the long cycle um, life feature of Ultra capacitor uh, up to uh, 10, uh, sorry, 100,000 cycles. Um, because of the chemistry, um, physical re reactions involved, we have very high safety and high reliability. Um, because of the, um, uh, the, the voltage feature, uh, we have a very linear rel relationship between voltage and energy. So we are able to monitor and predict the energy contained very accurately. Um, through voltage. Uh, as you can see from the left, uh, a typical um, ultra capacitor is like this. It's a, it's a pure physical attraction. Uh, if you apply electricity, you will see the positive and negative electrons will attract the negative and positive ions inside electrolyte to form a double layer. That's why the uh, products called um, electric double layer capacitor. What we did for our product is that we doped it with um, some uh, particles inside the uh, carbon and make sure uh, to make the energy uh, goes much higher. So we combine the ultra capacitor and lithium ion battery technology in one electro electrolytic pool. Next slide. And so over the years, we have developed different kinds of ultra capacitors. We are able to make different forms uh, of uh, capacitor um, to accommodate different needs of customers. Next slide. Um, so our main uh, market is on, sorry, last one. Uh, our main uh, market is on trams, and we have 30% on buses and 25% uh, on locomotive and 5% on other, others. Next slide. Not only did we uh, focus our product, we also focus on, on the participating on the uh, standards. We have uh, successfully compiled five industry standards and one district standards. Um, next slide. We also initiated in, um, in Israel um, one of our slide, uh, one of our standards being identically uh, adopted uh, for Israeli market. Next slide. 
So part two is the application of our products uh, around the world. So we started in Shanghai uh, with 17 buses and uh, next 30, 62 buses in 2010. And uh, until today, we have uh, almost uh, 200 buses running in Shanghai. Next slide. And uh, this is in Sichuan province. Uh, we delivered in 2016, 45 buses. Next slide. And uh, also uh, in around the world, um, we started in Bulgaria with 15 buses. And right now we have uh, up to uh, 60 buses running in Sofia. Next slide. Uh, we started also in 2016 in Israel. Right now we have 36 buses um, running in Israel. Um, Serbia, uh, we started with five. Right now we are uh, to, to deliver another 10 for Serbia market. Uh, in Belarus, starting in 2017, we have delivered um, for 105 buses um, right now. Um, other cities like us in Graz in Austria and uh, in Macedonia and uh, Let's Bet here in Italy, we have prototypes running since 2017. Um, part three is for trams. This is a uh, typical also like we have what we have done on buses. We charge only in terminals. So within minutes, we charge fully and we run the whole route. Um, so starting also in 2015, we have delivered until today. Uh, you have 70... one minute left. Okay, next slide. And uh, also we have delivered uh, close to 100 vehicles in Shanghai. Next. And uh, we delivered also for some industry uh, locomotives for mining industry. Next slide. And also we have uh, delivered products for, um, for ferries, uh, short distance, but uh, with uh, short charging uh, minutes. As you can see here, it's only 1.6 kilometers and uh, 10 minutes charging. Next slide. And uh, um, I think that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and next, I'd like to welcome on the floor, Michel De Vivo, CEO of Depsis. Minion, maybe you can switch off your camera. Thank you. Yeah, morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me today. I'm Michael De Vivo, CEO and founder of Depsis. So um, just a few words about Depsis. Depsis is a, is a Swiss technology company born in 2012, uh, almost a 10 year company based in the French part of Switzerland, close to Lausanne, with subsidiaries in uh, Germany and in the UK. We, have, we are what we call a scale up, a company in constant growth evolutions. We are backed by three venture capital, one bank, BNP Paribas, and uh, always looking for partners, investors to grow internationally. We have a strong leadership in Switzerland, where we, uh, we, are, we have more than 4,000 grids under deployments, but also present in, uh, in more than 10 countries around the world. Currently in Asia, we are mainly active in Hong Kong and Japan, but also had several exchanges in the past with, um, with China's companies, University Tsinghua, Tianjin University, at the political level with CCPS, the, the China Communist Party School, and industry like State Grid Corporation of China, Yingli Solar, ES Lab, Smart Grid Lab, and so on. So China is definitely number one worldwide in terms of DER accelerations and grid penetration. So happy to present today in this forum and exchange on the electricity grid topic uh, with interested parties. Um, so now the context in which we operate uh, is probably well known by the by the forum participants already discussed at many levels. So I will not go in details. Just to emphasize that we are surfing on two waves, uh, the energy transition on one, on one side, climate targets, CO2 reductions, uh, clean energy and so on. And on the second aspect, digitalizations. And for us, the digitalization is a necessary step 
for the energy transition. So we can actually summarize these slides, the energy context, saying that the electricity grid industry is under three different types of pressure. There is the typical physical pressure. So it's about the infrastructure, a grid not built for a decentralized energy management, aging assets, no visibility. The second is about people. So far, the grid knowledge were in few heads, not accessible by many, many peoples. So an important portion of the grid knowledge will be lost with some generation of people. So there is an urgency to start deploying sensors to be able within a few years to have enough historical data to start finally taking decisions with more confidence. And, and furthermore, the new generation of people will likely not stay in the same company during 30 years, maybe three, four, five years. And the last one is about digitalization. So we have more and more people in the fields managing more and more DER from more and more central systems, and that's not a viable model. So grids will have to be managed decentrally in order to minimize operational cost and finally work from everywhere, anytime. And this point has been, I think, amplified during the pandemic because grid operators realized how important it's to manage the grid from different locations at, at all levels. In this slide, we actually see a bit better the portion of the grids that will likely be the one under pressure. So you have the transmission grid, distribution grid, stepping down until homes. And the last miles is the portion of the grid that will be mainly affected by electric vehicles, photovoltaics, where most of the outages happens and where TSOs, grid operators, are blind. So actually, it's where we have to bring intelligence and technologies. Adepsis, we believe that by the end of these decades, every distribution grid will become digital. So we can, we can challenge that statement if it's really 100% or a bit less, but, but undoubtedly DSOs will have to turn into data. And, and grid operators are today rightly risk-averse companies. So this is quite normal because as, as mentioned sev several times by the, the, the other um, speakers, they are managing a mission critical infrastructure. So there is no real reasons to, <clears throat> to take too much risk and make compromise on, on security. <clears throat> so they, they will have to trust any additional piece of electronic they put into the grid. New technologies have to be secured, performance at the same time. And, and for us, the success of the energy transition finally rely on a grid where data capture data accuracy, data adaptability, and security are built on trust and simplicity. This, this is TEPSI's vision. Now, what is the situation in the field? The digitalization of grid operations is not today standardized. The consequence of this lack of standardization is pushing grid operators around the world to decide on a different strategy, a different approach, different technology, different architectures, different speeds. And this is why at Depsis we created the model you see on the screen called Digital Grid Maturity Curve, used by many grid operators, where we see the steps through which any one of them will have to pass in order to build the digitalization journey. So independently of the strategy and the reason why they will have to digitalize the grid could be for DR penetration for fault management, for power quality, they will have to start adding data capture in real time. This is the foundation. Then implement layers on top to analyze data, then have the ability to act and control, and at the end to predict what can happen in the grid in the future days, weeks, and months. So most of DSOs around the world today are still on phase one. And this phase is the most important one because if the data quality is not at the right level, security, accuracy, frequency, and so on, use cases will be strongly limited. Uh, here you see our technology called GridEye that allows grid operators to build from scratch the digitalization strategy in order to finally succeed in these energy transition objectives. There is a quote I like a lot saying that people 
who are already serious, who are really serious about software should make their own hardware. And in order to bring value from data, the data should be processed in a certain way, ideally in a fully decentralized way, in order to minimize communication costs. And this is how we have built our smart grid technology today. Michael, that is a, 45 yeah. seconds left. Yeah, in, in, uh, in operations globally. So actually, technologies should be built on three pillars. Modelless, so no need to know the model of the grid because it's not known. Decentralized intelligence at the distributed level because we have thousands more data to collect and monitor. And finally, it's about simplicity. Installations, integration, operations, and use. Everything should be today simple for grid operators. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And we move to the last presentation of the day. Dr. Weiwei Li, Assistant Director of CSG Electric Power Research Institute, please. And Mike, maybe turn off the camera. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh... Can you see my slides? Yeah, uh, yes, we see your desktop. Now the slides, yeah, it's coming. Okay, uh, the, the slides on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, it's a great honor to be here to share the to share the research and application of the DC technology in China's Southern Power Grade, uh, powered by CSG. One of the most important uh, motivation of the DC technology in uh, CSG is the reverse distribution of energy resources and electricity demand. Uh, as you can see in the diagram at the bottom, more than 90% of the, uh, uh, of the uh, primary energy uh, is located at Yunnan and Guizhou province, which is in the west of CSG. And uh, about 60% of the electricity consumption is from Guangdong. Uh, uh, which is uh, it's from Guangdong, uh, which is uh, in the east of the CSG. And there are other motivations of the uh, uh, DC technology, such as operational, operation challenge of large-scale AC DC power grade and integration of renewable energy, and the emergency, emerging, emerging DC loads. Uh, this set uh, gives the uh, HV DC power transmission in CSG. Uh, uh, you know, we totally have uh, 10 HVDCs and 8 HVACs. Uh, the uh, capacity of the HVDC is about 40.2 uh, gigawatts and HVACs is uh, 8.3 gigawatts. The ratio of this is about 82%. 30% uh, uh, of Guangdong load is provided by HVDC, which means the HVDC is quite important for CSG. Uh, to, uh, to achieve a more reliable and controllable power grade, we also have done a lot of work on the new type, new type of HVDC DC power transmission, uh, which is a water source converter DC power transmission. We, we have four projects, uh, the now MTDC VSC and the Lucy back-to-back -back VSC and the uh, Ultra HVDC VSC, the Guangdong back-to-back -back VSC. Uh, this is a now multi-terminal DC VSC project. This project gathers the wind power from the uh, island and send them to the mainland. Uh, the, rated, the rated voltage is about 160 kV. And this is the first uh, multi-terminal DC VSC project worldwide. Uh, this project is commissioned since two, 2013. Uh, the uh, wind power absorption is enhanced. As you can see in the right, uh, with or without AC uh, voltage control of the VSC, uh, the uh, voltage fluctuation of the AC voltage is reduced by more than 50%. The system availability is above 95.8%. Uh, this is a Lucy back-to-back -back VSC project. Uh, the commercial oper operation since 2016. This project breaking up the large-scale AC grade of CSG with the VSC HVDC technology, uh, which reduces the risk of the system-wide black holes uh, caused by the large-scale power transfer, power flow transfer. Uh, the rated DC voltage about uh, 350 kV. Uh, uh, this is a picture of the uh, Lucy commuter station. And the, uh, in the central, the Blue House, which is a uh, Wolf Hall, is the center of the, is, is the heart of the project.
which has uh, for the rectifier side wall, we use the 4.5 kV IEGT and the loss is about 0.55%. And for the inverted side wall, uh, which connects the uh, ground province, we use the 3.3 kV IGBT and loss is about uh, 0.74%. Uh, this is a Kunlun UHVDC VLC project uh, commissioned last year. This is the first 800 kV UHVDC VLC project worldwide, uh, and the, uh, there are some unique uh, some unique features of this project, which is the first the UHV and the uh, multi terminal, and the, the and the largest capacity of the uh, VLC converter station. Uh, also, the hybrid uh, HVDC technology such as the LCC plus VLC, and the uh, 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 overhead line, over, long, long distance overhead line DC for the self elimination technology is also used in this project. This is a picture of the uh, uh, largest capacity VLC commercial station uh, located at Guangdong province. Uh, the uh, green green one is a 400 kV walk hole, and the white one is a 800 kV walk hole. Uh, and for the medium body DC and the low body DC power distribution in CSG. As you can see in the picture, uh, the, uh, they are inherently suitable for the interfacing renewable uh, generation system and DC loads. Uh, also the reduction of the power conversion stage cost and loss. Uh, this is a Tangjia Bay pilot project, uh, which is a four terminal DC distribution system in Zhuhai. Uh, it is commissioned since uh, 2018. Uh, we have the uh, uh, 10 kV DC and AC bus, also the uh, DC solid state transformer is used in this project and the DC breakers, DC recharge PV and uh, energy storage. Um, uh, the, this, this project uh, balanced the, uh, the power flow from the three AC substitution, substitution, uh, substit, substation. And the, uh, this is a Guido campus pilot project. Uh, uh, we also have the 10 kV AC and DC uh, bus and the uh, uh, AC and DC micrograde. Also the DC solid state transformer is used. Uh, this is a fortune distribu distribution project with a soft open point, uh, uh, which is a three terminal uh, SOP based on MMC. This project makes it possible for the closed loop operation uh, 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 of the uh, 10 kV AC uh, power distribution system uh, to solve the problem of the, the integration of the dis distributed PV generations, shock load, and the sensitive load. Um, uh, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, for your insights and presentations. Uh, um, we're through the program, but we'll have a few minutes left for any left questions. I saw that a few questions were already answered uh, by the speakers themselves through the Q&A functionality. So thank you very much for doing that already. So I'd just like to ask um, all the speakers of the day, I don't know if you yourself have any question for another speaker, then uh, you can actually just turn on your microphone and, and ask the question or uh, raise your hand below. Um, but while we wait for the very first question, I'm just going to read one that we still have open in the Q&A function. And it's a question to Min Yuan. I don't know if Min Yuan is still around. And the question is, is there any impact of your product at very high or very low temperatures or any limitations? So Min Yuan, if you're around, there's a question for you. So maybe it seems that um, he already left the meeting, maybe. Um, otherwise, all the speakers, you find all their contacts in the participants booklet. You can also reach out to everyone directly and ask your questions. Um, I'm going to ask one more time into the round if anyone, any participant or any speaker has a question to anyone. Okay, seems not to be the case. Otherwise, as I said, you can reach out to everyone directly as well. 
Well, in that case, um, I would say we close this very first day of this inaugural event, the very first Sino Swiss um, Energy Innovation Forum. Tomorrow will continue with day two, and it will be lovely if we would see you again. It will be at the same time. Um, thank you very much. So see you tomorrow. Ming Tian Jian, and bye bye.